If this video doesn't disturb you, I don't know what will. I don't need to, I think, shake you out of your doldrums. I think you're all um, clear to the threat. But even though we're clear to the threat of big business, NGOs, and the government working together to crush our liber civil liberties, even this describe, uh, excuse me, disturbed me. The description of what Tucker Carlson heard about uh, Bank of America. Check this out. What an extremist is. So we're left to guess. We're left to look around nervously to see if we can spot one. Hoping against hope the whole time they're not talking about us, are they? And if they are, what exactly are they doing? How are they hunting these extremists they keep telling us about but will not describe? We now know part of the answer to that question. This show has obtained exclusively evidence that Bank of America, the second largest bank in the country with more than 60 million customers, is actively but secretly engaged in the hunt for extremists in cooperation with the government. Bank of America is, without the knowledge or the consent of its customers, sharing private information with federal law enforcement agencies. Bank of America effectively is acting as an intelligence agency, but they're not telling you about it. In the days after the January 6th riot at the Capitol, Bank of America went through its own customers' financial and transaction records, a lot of them. Now, these were the private records of Americans who had committed no crime. People who, as far as we know, had absolutely nothing to do with what happened at the Capitol on January 6th. But at the request of federal investigators, Bank of America searched its databases looking for people who fit a specific profile. Here's what that profile was, and we are quoting. Customers confirmed as transacting, either through bank account, debit card, or credit card, purchases in Washington, D.C., between January 5th and January 6th. Number two, purchases made for hotels, Airbnb, RSVPs in Washington, Virginia, or Maryland after January 6th. Number three, any purchase of weapons or at a weapons-related merchant between January 7th and their upcoming suspected stay in the D.C. area around Inauguration Day. And four, airline-related purchases sixth, sixth, since January 6th. Wow. Now, again, to be clear, these are allegations against Bank of America. That segment's over five minutes long. In the interest of time, we had to cut it down to two minutes. It was even hard to do that. I wanted to play the entire thing because it's really that disturbing. But they are allegations, and Bank of America is not denying them, but not confirming them either. Give you both sides of that story. However, this is a news story absolutely worth discussing. Did this happen? I'd like a conclusive, definitive, descriptive uh, answer from Bank of America as to what they did, because we have a small account there, which um, if true, we will be closing immediately. It's not a large account there, but we will be closing that immediately. So just to be clear, if you went to the January 6th uh, rally, of which a small group engaged in some really pernicious uh, behavior up at the Capitol, which we obviously all know about now. But a larger group didn't and just went there to do what Americans do, protest, assemble, you know, things like the Bill of Rights and the Constitution, the First Amendment, the big R God-given right, not government-given right to assemble. If you went there, you may be subject to some kind of internal investigation by a bank in cahoots with a federal government with law enforcement powers that has a monopoly on force and the ability to arrest you, you could be potentially interviewed. Folks, I'd like an answer. If this story is not true, uh, Bank of America, our, our email's on the website. We'd love to have an official statement. You knocking this down if, it is, if this is in fact inaccurate. Because if it, if it isn't and this story is true, uh, we will be doing no additional banking with Bank of America at all. These are very, very disturbing allegations. I was going to cover this last, but the importance of this was so dramatic, I had to bump it up to the beginning of the show. Because what's fascinating is it coincides directly with another story I was going to cover, I found doing my research for the show today. This, I found this story yesterday before I saw the story, before I saw the story this morning about the Tucker Carlson thing. And they fit perfectly. It's a story in Time Magazine about, quote, the secret history of the shadow campaign that saved the 2020 election in Time Magazine by Molly Ball. Oh, if there is ever 
ever an article you must read in the show notes, please read this one. To access my newsletter show notes, it's the same thing. Please go to Bongino.com slash newsletter and please subscribe. You'd be helping me greatly too. I need to bypass the internet sensors and be able to talk directly to you. We will not spam your inbox. Before I get to screenshots from this article, folks, there's a very dangerous thing happening in this country right now. The big businesses and the businesses we've reflexively as Republicans supported over the years because we believe in free markets, liberty, and capitalism, that reflexive defense of them has got to stop. Folks, listen, self-deprecating here, but true. I was one of them. Government stay out of business, business stay out of government. None of that's happening anymore. None of that. Government is deeply involved in business if not directly through their political ideological allies and NGOs and outside entities that aren't direct government actors, but work with them. And business is involved with government by doing things like trying to influence the 2020 election. You don't believe me? Read this article. I'll get to a screenshot here in a second. The whole approach from big business, which used to be business is about the Milton Friedman approach, providing products people need at a price they're willing to pay. Crazy idea, Paula, crazy. Like that's the idea of business. Build products people want, uh, create services people want, and sell them for a price they're willing to pay. Shocker. Big, bold idea of how business in America is supposed to work. That's not how it works anymore. Business works right now about 60% of the time to produce products and 40% of the time to kiss the collective arse of the government that can in turn bestow upon them benefits other businesses don't get. And in exchange, businesses then attack anyone who gets in the way, like conservatives who don't want this symbiote between business and government. The whole approach now is not to provide value for shareholders, people who actually own the businesses. The whole approach by business now, not all a business, but particularly big businesses and big tech. I hate that terminology, but in this case, it's true. The whole approach now is to take care of not shareholders, but stakeholders. Those are not the same thing. Do not fall in this trap. You'll notice now, every time, now when you hear it, it'll ding, ding, ding. It'll bell like the Kenny Bell in your head. Whenever you hear leftists now talk about business and their interests, they talk about the business's stakeholders. Stakeholders are, they can be shareholders, but they are not the same thing. Shareholders are people who actually own the business, who stand to lose if the business makes dumb decisions. That's not who Elizabeth Warren and others want you to support. They want you to support the stakeholders, people who have a stake, but not necessarily a share in the business. Who would that be? Oh, communities. They'll say marginalized communities. They'll make up these terms to make it seem like you're a racist for not supporting stakeholders. Environmental groups, they're stakeholders too. These companies, uh, they, uh, they may be polluters. They're stakeholders too. That's what they do to go, oh, well, I'm not for polluters. Therefore, support the stakeholders. Stakeholders can be shareholders, but are not necessarily the same thing. I cannot think of a more destructive way to handle American business than to turn American businesses over to leftist groups that are not shareholders, have no interest in the company financially whatsoever, will lose nothing by making bad decisions, but they'll be considered stakeholders who should get a seat at the table. Look it up. Just put in shareholders, Elizabeth Warren, every time she talks about business, she, uh, excuse me, stakeholders, she talks about stakeholders, not shareholders. This is a dangerous trend that has to stop now. They always use the environmental example. Well, businesses pollute, so therefore there are stakeholders. I mean, yeah, I get that. I get that. But that's not what's happening. The stakeholders are leftist groups that are now influencing big business that are in turn paying them back by influencing elections. Look at this time piece if you think uh, this uh, piece from time, this article, if you think I'm, make, uh, make, I'm making this up, excuse me, and read it, the whole thing. They're now openly talking about a conspiracy behind their words, not mine. Their words, they're mine, uh, not mine. A conspiracy to intervene in and influence the 2020 election. They're talking about it now openly, openly. There was a conspiracy unfolding behind the scenes, one that both curtailed the protests and coordinated the resistance from CEOs. Oh yeah, from CEOs. 
Both surprises were the result of an informal alliance between left-wing activists and business titans. There we go, folks. There's the money line. The pact was formalized in a terse, little-noticed joint statement of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. It's turned on us, by the way. And AFL-CIO published on Election Day. Both sides would come to see it as a sort of implicit bargain inspired by the summer's massive, sometimes destructive racial justice protests. Oh, kind of like what I told you during the summer when this was happening, that the left was using their shock troops on the front line in these protests to scare people into doing this. Ah, you didn't waste your time here. I told you. It goes on. In which the forces of labor came together with the forces of capital to keep the peace and oppose Trump's assault on democracy. Ladies and gentlemen, you believe this? They're now openly... Bra- Wait till I get to this second. The second one's a little bit longer, but it is worth your time. They are now openly bragging about the conspiracy to intervene in the 2020 election and telling you what I told you. It's not a celebratory, hey, look at me moment. It's just, I can't warn you enough about what they're doing. Nothing the left does is by accident. You may not like them, but you better respect them. I don't mean respect them in a moral way. Like, my gosh, they are are on the Mount Olympus of morals. What wonderful people. We should beatify them. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying respect them like you'd get in the ring with a serial killer who's a really great boxer who, if you don't respect his skills, he will kill you in the ring. You better not like him, but you better respect it. Ladies and gentlemen, the left strategy and skills at doing this are unparalleled. You have to understand in advance and know them in detail. You have to take a PhD level course, which I'm hoping to provide some component of for you here in understanding leftist tactics. That one piece I just described to you sums the entire thing up. They send their shock troops out there. They're pro-fascist Antifa people. They're Black Lives Matters Marxists who admit they're Marxists. They send them out there to, stre- to create a bunch of street chaos. That creates a bunch of tension. What does it do? That tension gets corporate CEOs nervous. Gosh, we don't want our profits to dry up. What if government comes after us next? Interest groups then pressure these corporations to all issue statements in support of who? BLM. Remember all those emails you got? We support Black Lives Matter. Then the leftist messaging machine goes in. Oh, you don't support Black Lives Matter? You're clearly a racist. You don't like Black Lives? No, no, no. They said they were Marxists and they don't like the American family. No, no, that's not what Black Lives Matter is about. Black Lives. Yeah, but that's not what Black Lives Matter said. Their leader, that's not what they said. They're on tape. Doesn't matter. The messaging, the shock troops, they're all in place right away to pressure corporate America. Corporate America, then do, corporate America then donates big money to leftist groups, which do what? Organize to get out the vote, to push for uh, laws that would destroy free and fair election laws. And how do they do it? They then win elections. Which what do what? Bring in people who then go and reinforce their corporate CEO buddies by carving out regulations that benefit them and destroy their small business, uh, small business challengers. What a deal. They're admitting it now. It is all in this piece. They're admitting it. You may say to you, I'm sorry, I'm a little excited because I was going to talk about this before the Tucker segment, before I even saw the Tucker segment about Bank of America allegedly working with the government to pinpoint people who were at the January 6th rally, exercising their constitutional right. Not the people who attacked the Capitol. If you know constitutional right to do that, it's criminal. The people who were there, the thousands of people who were there did nothing wrong. These are serious allegations. I saw the Tucker story after this piece. Why are they talking about it now? Why are they outing themselves? Because you remember the Michael Anton piece I discussed a while ago about how the best way to debunk a conspiracy, that this is a conspiracy, is to talk openly about the conspiracy. No, no, it wasn't a conspiracy behind the scenes to do any. We're talking about it openly now. Ladies and gentlemen, they don't want to be discovered later because they know all this is going to be eventually public information. So what are they doing? They write an article about it at a time now. Like, no, no, it wasn't a big conspiracy. We're just going to write about the conspiracy. It was out there. We're proud of it now. That's exactly why they're doing Do not doubt me, please. Hat tip Rush Limbaugh. That is his saying, but I love it. Always footnote that. Don't doubt me for a moment. They are putting this out there because they know when the tensions and the anger about the 2020 election and how it went, deservedly so, 
wears down, that this is all going to come out. They don't want it to appear like a conspiracy, so now they're talking about it with their media allies openly to frame the argument on their behalf so they can say later, it wasn't a conspiracy. We talked about it in Time Magazine. 